First, we need to find the power density of the sunlight at the moon's surface at 450 terahertz. Assuming the sun radiates isotropically means that the radiated power spreads out equally in all directions. It spreads out over the surface area of a sphere expanding outward from the center where the sun is. By the time the sunlight reaches the moon's surface, so here let's say this is the moon, the power has spread out over a sphere with a radius roughly equal to the radius of the Earth's orbit. So we're going to say this distance here was given as 1.5 times 10 to the eighth kilometers. So it's going to this power is going to be spread out over a sphere of that radius. The power density at the moon's surface is then s average p sun over 4 pi r squared. If we plug in our values, we get S average is 990 watts per meter squared. Then to solve for the electric field strength at the surface of the moon, it helps to know if we have a plane wave or not. We can assume a plane wave if we are a couple wavelengths or so away from the source. Since the wavelength at 450 terahertz is on the order of 670 nanometers, the moon is definitely sufficiently far away from the sun that we can consider the incident sunlight on the moon to be a plane wave. As a result, we can use that plane wave uh, power density expression that we had for the uh, time average power density. And also, it simplifies a bit because we're in free space, so alpha is going to be equal to zero, um, eight is going to be just a real number, so we have s average. Now there is a direction associated with s, um, but we are only given the, well, I guess we know the direction is towards the moon, and um, so, okay, we can write that, k hat, where k hat points towards the moon, and then this will have e naught squared, which is what we're looking for, and 2, and eta is just eta for free space. And we know this is equal to 990 watts per meter squared. So eta, not for free space, is 377 ohms. And so solving for E naught, we get 864 volts per meter. All right, let's get back to our design challenge. Once the electromagnetic wave has propagated through the ionosphere, we still need to receive it on the ground. Earlier I showed this diagram of the signal propagating from the satellite. On the ground, satellite signals are typically received using parabolic dish reflectors, which help to collect more of the energy from the wave so that a stronger signal can be received here at the feed. The required area of the dish reflector depends on how strong of a signal we're expecting from the satellite. The dish reflector reflects electromagnetic waves towards what's called, here we have a feed horn, and uh, here's another diagram of a feed horn, here's another, the feed horn. Um, this image on the right here shows a real life parabolic dish reflector. Notice that the reflector is not made out of a solid material. We've already talked about why it would not need to be a, made of a solid material during the design challenge relating to EMPs. In the feed horn, horn, we would need to have an antenna to receive the signal. And the simplest way to receive the signal is to just extend a metal probe, you can see that right here, a metal cylinder across the horn. We'll talk about this more in the antennas portion of the class, but any electric field here, incoming electric field of our uh, plane wave, that is parallel to the probe will induce a current on the probe, and this will allow the power in the electromagnetic wave to be received by the antenna. So if our receiving antenna has a vertical probe in it, as you can see here, it means we can receive what's called a linearly polarized wave, where the electric field is parallel, as shown here, to the probe. Here is an example of a linearly polarized wave. It's propagating 
in the z direction and it's polarized in the x direction. We use the electric field to describe the polarization. In this case, we would want to have our probe in the horn aligned in the x direction, so in the, parallel with the E field, in order to pick up that electric field. More generally, the electric field doesn't have to be aligned exactly along an axis of our coordinate system. Here's an example of a linearly polarized wave at a 60 degree angle from the x axis, and these plots show the evolution of the electric field vector over time. So these are all at z equals zero, and time here is changing. So as time evolves, you can see this electric field vector is basically going to be moving back and forth like this. It's tracing out a straight line, which is why it's called linearly, uh, it's a linearly polarized wave. Let's write the, an expression for an electric field vector phasor for a wave propagating in the z direction for a linearly polarized wave. So if it's propagating in the z direction, we can say in general it can have both an x hat component and a y hat component. And these can have different amplitudes. Different amplitudes would give us different angles with the x and the y axis. So I'm going to say this has an amplitude of EY0 and this one EX0. They can both have a constant phase that doesn't change with time. It's just everywhere in space. So E to the J phi naught. But they must have the same uh, argument. So E to the minus gamma Z. They must have the same phase. So it's linearly polarized if the phase is exactly the same. Let's say the antenna on our satellite transmits a linearly polarized wave. In order to properly receive the signal on the ground then, we should ask ourselves, can we use a probe like the one on the previous slide to receive the signal after it has propagated through the ionosphere? If so, in what direction should the probe be oriented?